Hello there and welcome back to Gage Hill Crafts. My name is Sarah and this is a continuation in the series that I'm calling Sheep to Sweater. Um, it's a multi-month project um, that I started last year and my objective is to go from uh, taking wool off of our sheep all the way through the various steps of processing and preparing um, wool to spin spinning that uh, wool into yarn and then knitting myself a sweater. Um, and this week's episode is a continuation of experimenting with various washing methods. If you're curious about the other washing methods I've tried thus far, you can go back to the list of videos. Um, and I might just put together a playlist just for this particular series. Um, it'll be under fiber arts um, anyway, but maybe I'll do a, a special playlist so you can find all the videos related to this project. Um, and I've tried various uh, washing methods that I've been reading about um, through uh, books, the internet, um, and some training videos um, that I have access to. But this is an ancient method um, called a suant vat, and I've discussed a little bit about it before, hinted around about it before. Um, the idea is that you're using the natural properties of the dirt uh, the sweat or the suint um, and the lanolin and the other components that are on the wool itself um, to ferment in a vat and to use that as kind of a self-cleaning method. Um, so the way that you do this is that you take a dirty fleece and you place it into a vat of tepid water, room temperature or slightly warm water, and you leave it in there for a couple of weeks. Um, Mine has actually been fermenting for about five weeks because I started this just before um, the winter holidays got cranked up and then just haven't had time um, to work with it since then. Or when I did have time, we had really terrible weather and I have to do some of this work outside. So it's been a bit difficult to continue um, this process with this particular washing uh, method in the winter time. Um, uh, so I will warn you about that if you live in a cold climate or something. This is definitely more of a spring or summertime activity. Um, but I wanted to share my results today. I finally got to wash uh, my suant soaked fleece and, um, you know, get the rest of the dirt out of it and compare it with previous results. So um, before I get into the kind of end result, let me say this is probably the smelliest activity, the smelliest thing I've encountered in at least recent memory, um, if not all time. Um, yeah, I knew it was going to smell bad. I knew that, you know, anything fermented can kind of tend to stink, um, especially if it's something like fermented dirt, fermented sheep manure, that kind of thing. Um, you know, we've had, we've had farm animals for over 10 years now. Uh, Rick and I do have to clean out the barn in the spring and you've got layers of uh, manure and old bedding mixed together that you're shoveling um, and that can definitely have a strong odor. You can definitely have some uh, amo ammonia off gassing from, from uh, that, uh, that stuff breaking down in the barn. But this, this was worse. This was a lot worse. Um, a few years ago, and I, I've never done an episode on this because it's not something I'm willing to repeat, um, but a few years ago I convinced myself that trying a fermented indigo vat for natural dyeing would be fun, um, and to get that started you use stale urine. Um, and so, you know, Rick and I uh, did that, and uh, and that was bad. Um, it took a lot of washing uh, and some treating with some filtered charcoal in order to get the smell out of the finished yarn. Um, and this is worse. Um, this is definitely both worse in quality and also the strength of the smell. Um, I would say that if I if I knew how to write an epic poem, this would be deserving of it, this, this odor. Um, I, I can't, I don't think I, it's possible to exaggerate how bad it is. Um, and it surprised me because I kept checking on my vat every couple of weeks um, while it was fermenting, just lifting the lid, you know, seeing if there were any apparent changes on the surface of the of the water, seeing if uh, if I could detect an odor. Um, 
And I kept taking the lid off and thinking, wow, it really doesn't smell bad. You know, it smells vaguely of sheep, um, but so does a raw fleece. Um, but today, once I got my um, onion bag down into the water and started to transfer the soaked fleece into the onion bag in preparation for washing, I stirred up that vat really well and wow, it almost knocked me down. Um, it was not just the quality of the bad smell, which was pretty bad, but the intensity of it, my word. Um, so this is a big warning to you. Um, if you're thinking about this method, I would definitely say it's much better suited to doing outside. Um, and I would really caution you about doing it in, you know, something like your regular living space. If you have, if you live in a small apartment or you don't have a lot of room, this may not be a very good method to use, um, especially if you're sensitive to smells. And if you're very sensitive to bad smells, I would say don't even attempt it at all. Um, because no matter where you do this, it is going to stink. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess I'm just so surprised. <laughs> I knew it was going to smell bad, but I had no idea. Um, so beyond the beyond the terrible odor, um, which I'm actually genuinely concerned that the fleece is going to hang on to this odor. Um, you know, I, I washed it several times. Um, I was going to try to just rinse uh, this fleece without any soap or detergent. Um, so let me back up. So previous um, washing methods I've used have all used deter detergent. And one of the reasons I wanted to investigate the suet method for myself was that I'd read you know, some hints that you would, you could use either far less detergent or maybe even no detergent um, to do this method. And that intrigued me because detergent is, you know, it's generally manufactured out of petroleum products um, and the finished detergent is often high in phosphates. It's not, um, it's not good stuff to be putting into the environment, into your wastewater system, uh, into a city sewer, etc. So getting away from detergent and using less water to process a fleece um, would be environmentally friendly, and so I thought I'd give this a try. And I'm just not sure about the payoff, um, to be honest, because the wet fleece is now down in my basement after several washings with scented soap. It still stinks to high heaven. It just smells really bad. Um, I had to apologize to Rick, who is fortunately very understanding of all my wacky um, experiments and processes that I want to try. And, you know, he was remarking on the smell. He's, he's okay with it, and we're going to just tough it out and wait for this fleece to dry. But, yeah, um, that basement smells really bad right now, and you can kind of smell it in the house. So, really, use caution if you're going to dry this. I don't know that I'm going to do it again. Um, I will say that it was possibly more effective than just the cold water uh, pre-rinse by itself. Um, and I don't know if that just had the, to do with the length of time that this was soaking in water, you know, maybe just the water itself helped break down, um, some of the dirt that was on the, the locks. Um, but it does put, look, uh, as white and bright as the cold water rinse, um, fleece that I had done last time. And it took less washing to get to that point and less detergent to get to that point. Now, like I said, I did still use some detergent. I did two detergent hot water washes after um, pulling it out of the suet vat, pulling the fleece out of the suet vat. Um, and that was partially because of the smell and just because I couldn't, I was having trouble standing being in the same room and trying to work with this thing. And so I decided to use some scented detergent to wash just, just so I could handle it. Um, so instead of the six to seven wash rinse cycles that I had been doing on previous fleeces, um, I managed to get this one down to four, which is good. That's less detergent and less water overall. Um, but the trade-off, wow, the trade-off with that smell. Um, and I think I'm going to have to use activated charcoal again uh, to wash the final yarn to really get the smell out because I don't think there's any kind of scented soap in the world that is going to be able to mask this odor. Um, and activated charcoal was the only thing that would, that got the stale urine smell out of the yarn that I had dyed with the fermented indigo vat before. So I know that that can work on really strong odors and I'm glad I still have some left um, because I think this is gonna require that. 
So that's another tip. Um, you can get activated charcoal from another uh, a number of sources online. Um, I actually got mine as capsules that are sold as a, a health supplement. Um, and the, the health benefits, if you will, of eating activated charcoal are, I think, somewhat dubious. Um, but you can get activated charcoal in these capsule forms, and that allows you to measure out, you know, small amounts of it. It's not cheap, um, and also be able to handle it without getting it all over everything. So you can just put the capsules in some water, let them dissolve uh, in the water, and then you don't have this charcoal powder getting all over, you know, your workspace or your kitchen or wherever you're working. So yeah, I think I'm going to have to use the activated charcoal to treat the finished yarn if I can stand to spin it. Um, and that's the other question is, you know, how badly is this going to smell after it's dry? Um, I think like with anything, uh, you know, this, the smell is enhanced when it's, when the wool is damp and hopefully it won't be quite so strong when the wool dries and I'll, I'll be able to stand to work with it, comb it out and, and begin preparing it for spinning. Um, but we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be sure to let you know. Um, I may have to, I guess, do a, a hot water rinse with the activated charcoal um, on the yarn if it's too smelly to work with uh, otherwise. So we'll just have to wait and see. This is one of those, this experiment is not finished yet um, things, but I wanted to give, give you an update. Um, and you know, I will say that while while this did use less water and less detergent to get to the point of, of relative cleanliness, um, it was certainly not more clean than any of the other methods that I've tried. So again, it's hard to recommend this um, given that overhead of horrible smell and needing, you know, a dedicated space to do this, um, whether the trade-off is really worth it uh, with the environmental impact. I think I think probably doing some pre-rinses with hot water um, and using less detergent is going to kind of get you to that same environmental um, threshold or um, benefit um, that, that this method would. Um, that said, I may try it one more time uh, in the summer. I will be uh, sharing our sheep again this spring, probably sometime in late April. and. So with the warm weather coming, you know, maybe it would be easier to do this outside, um, perhaps even more effective. Um, it's hard to keep the room where I have my suet vet fermenting right now. Um, it's hard to keep that room nice and warm. And apparently this method does benefit from, you know, 70 to 80 degree temperatures. Um, where the bacteria can really break down the dirt and, and do its job. And so, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if I really want to go through all this again, but maybe in the warm weather you would have uh, a more effective experience with this method. So we'll see. Um, this might be one of those things where after a few weeks pass, I kind of forget how awful it was and I'm willing to try it again. Who knows? Um, but anyway, in the meantime, I'm going to let the, uh, the various fleeces that I've washed thus far, I'm going to let those dry. I might wash one of my um, fin sheep fleeces, um, which is the ultimate target for this uh, sheep to sweater project, as I want to make it out of my fin sheep wool. And, uh, and thus far, I've been kind of experimenting on Romney um, wool because it's less prone to felting. Um, so I'm going to get, get all that well, up to the point of either carding or combing, um, and then that will be the next installment of this series. Will be you know hand preparing um, fibers for spinning. So that's probably going to take me a few more weeks, um, and we'll have some more content in the meantime. Um, however, if you've tried a suet method, um, please let me know in the comments. I would love to hear your thoughts on this. Um, have you ever tried to do it indoors? Do you always work outdoors? Um, do you know of any good resources? I've been, I've been, you know, searching around on the internet, of course, and there's pretty limited information about this method. I'm assuming there must be more in detail uh, instruction and you know, maybe some information about the science about how this works um, in a book somewhere, but I haven't found 
uh, what book that might be. So if you have any good resources for investigating this, I'm also trying to track down um, the article that I mentioned last time by Judith McKenzie that had been published in um, a, a magazine by Interweave Press. And if I can find a copy of that article, or if they send me one, um, I'll be happy to share uh, if there's any kind of historical information in there. Um, as always, I'd love to know what you're working on these days, whether you are someone who processes fleece or hand spins or, you know, knits, crochets, or does tapestry weaving or whatever it is that you like to work on, um, fiber related or otherwise, let me know what you're up to these days. Leave a comment below the video and tune in next week. We'll have more for you. Thanks a lot.